So my name is Mark Anderson. I um, work at Chef. Uh, we're a configuration management software company, if you're not familiar with us. And um, the talk is about push jobs, which is this tool we built to um, help solve some problems we were hitting with Chef. It's the uh, configuration management Chef. There is the Chef, the company, the Chef, the configuration management system. Uh, we use Chef a lot in our names. Um, is a set of recipes, it basically takes a set of recipes to converge a node into a state. The uh, chef client configuration management system uses a pool model, which is great until you want push. Um, and for some things, you really do want to have a push model. Um, SSH doesn't scale well for a lot of people. Um, back when we started this product, in about 2012, there weren't many other op systems available that did this. Since then, a number of other ones have sprung up and become popular, but we didn't have the advantage of them being available that or well worked out. And we had some sort of particular things, objectives we wanted. So what we wanted was a remote execution system that was robust under network and client failure, which everybody wants. We wanted execution to be gated on when a quorum of nodes was available. You wanted to be able to, say, require 90% of the nodes in a job to be available before you started execution, which was a feature that wasn't available in the other systems we looked at. Um, we wanted presence information as close to real time as available about whether a node was present and available to execute. Um, we wanted to scale initially to about 2K nodes, and that was sort of a, hey, we felt we could hit that goal. Let's start out with that. Um, we've been pretty happy with that, how we got, but we'll get to that in a bit. And wanted integrated with the Chef authentication and authorization systems. Um, Chef already distributes a uh, RSA key to its clients as part of provisioning, so we felt that just leveraging that was going to be helpful because you know, one of the v big problems of the Crypto system is how you could do key distribution, and rather than create our own key distribution system, why not leverage what we had? Um, and we kept in mind through the whole thing that a lot of our customers have somewhat complicated networks. They may have firewalls, they have, may have NATs, they may have a whole bunch of stuff between the mode under management and the chef server. So we wanted to make sure that we were support, supported that use case. Um, and as we've deployed push into places, we've discovered that uh, customers have even stranger networks than I ever imagined people would create. Um, so just going to go through a few of, the, a few of the design choices we start out when we start working on this. So our core design philosophies were took straight from OTP. We had had some experience with Erlang already. It had been really successful. Um, but what we had been building hadn't been actually that Erlang-y, um, mostly web machine-based things. Um, so uh, still run somewhat new to full up Erlang distributed systems. Uh, we decided just to still run with the principles. So don't try to be clever with errors. You can go crazy enumerating all the failure modes in a distributed system. We decided to not even try. And so our error handling is really, if it's under supervision monitoring, if it deviates from the expected state, we hit it with the big hammer and reset it to zero. Now, there's still a lot of cases that misses, but by and large, this actually covers a lot of the cases we've seen in practice. And it really, keeps it real, things really simple, which has been a real win for in terms of implementation for us. Um, I had a really good relationship with a colleague whose constant question was, do we need this feature? Can we throw this out? Um, I'm always the one who is the magpie for features, so we uh, were rescued from my designs. So we had a couple of initial conditions. Um, at the time we were doing this, the client was assumed to be in Ruby. There were a bunch of reasons. Largely, we were a Ruby shop with some Erlang people in it. Having most of this thing in Ruby was helpful. Um, we had already had Ruby on our machines because the Chef system is written in Ruby. So it made for a much simpler distribution system if you can just load another Chef chip. Um, servers in Erlang, um, one, we already had some good initial experiences with Erlang. Uh, we had been started rewriting our server from Ruby into Erlang, and there was a Chef Comp talk a few years about, go about that from Seth Falcon. Um, and that had been enormously successful. We've seen real products when Erlang at scale. And frankly, this was the actually the problem that was the most Erlang-y 
to coin a word, of anything we'd built to date. Um, so it just seemed like a natural choice. The um, other question is, OK, we have the client, we have the server. How do we wire them together? Um, we wanted rapid prototyping. We wanted reliable message delivery. Um, we wanted it portable. Um, we needed to have both Ruby and Erlang versions, unfortunately, because of the previous design choices. Had to be able to run on Windows. Um, had a laundry list of other possible operating systems we had to support. Um, we wanted heart beating, and we wanted signed messages and eventually full encryption of communications. So at, we looked at a bunch of things. We eventually chose, essentially, again, going for simplicity, ZeroMQ and JSON messages. Um, it turns out it is portable. It was very easy to get started with. It's like tinker, it was like Tinker Toys for networking. I've never built a network thing so fast. Um, we had prototypes running within a week or two. Um, eventually, it ended up with a, sort of a momentum of its own. When you're trying prototyping and one just starts working, you kind of have a motivation to stop looking. Um, we, uh, it did end up, some things we didn't get was their MQ. Um, we ended up building our own heartbeat system. We just, ZeroMQ had a crypto kind of in discussion and design, and we felt like we could wait a little bit for crypto and only sign our messages, but otherwise not encrypt them. Um, the other thing is, I'll be honest, we were a little bit optimistic about the, what should I say, reading the label on ZeroMQ. There are a lot of things in ZeroMQ which are outlines of how you do things, but in some cases they're not fully worked out. And as we dove into them, we discovered some of those outlines, like some of the heart beating protocols. There's some subtleties that we didn't take into account. Um, but in general, it was pretty successful. Um, we did look at a couple other things. We considered and rejected doing this as just a giant distributed Erlang nodes. The clients aren't really trusted in our system. And we're uncomfortable with that. Um, some concerns about 8K connected nodes, maybe that wasn't really a worry, but we had a lot, some reservations from people who had said, no, I hadn't, this is, this were not gonna work for us. Um, thought about raw, raw sockets. Um, we wanted quick prototyping, this didn't feel that like that. And, you know, avoid premature optimization. So, you know, a few other things were looked at. In the end, ZeroMQ, Ended up with a lot of momentum simply because it was simple, quick to get started with, and it just worked. Um, our, if you want to get a system started quickly, ZeroMQ was very nice. Um, so we kind of ended up on a communications model between the client and the server. So the things on the right-hand side are all on the server. The left-hand side is the client. The client does three basic kinds of communications with the server in our model. It gets uh, configuration information over HTTP from the server. It's a REST endpoint. Um, the client only needs a key and a URI to get started. Everything else, which ports to hit, what configuration, heartbeat rates, um, network topology information, like what nodes to use for what, all come from the server. Um, again, trying to keep the client as simple and stupid as possible. We listen to heartbeats from the server over a pub sub socket pair. Um, and everything else goes over dealer router to a message switch in the server. Um, so that includes we heartbeat from the client to the server and command and control messages of running this job, I finished this job, here's the output from this job. All that runs over this connection. So the job model, again, keeping things as simple as possible. All a job is is a list of clients to run it on and a command to execute. Um, the life cycle is very simple. We notify the clients of the job, gather votes to see if we have a quorum, if we have sufficient mean, machines available to run the job. Sometimes that might be 100%, just to be clear, but sometimes you, you want just, hey, if I can get 50% of my machines to take this, good. If the quorum's made, tell them all to execute. So there's sort of a um, commit, execute cycle to the way we run jobs. Um, just to walk this through, here's a more visual description of the server accepts a job from the user, sends a command, waits for the ax. Uh, if we get the quorum, we start execution, and then we collect results. Again, this was focusing on simple, and if we couldn't justify needing it immediately, 
We didn't put it in. Um, so I'm going to go a little bit into the internal details here of what we built. Um, so the, here's a little bit more of the architecture. So you've seen the right, left-hand side here with the clients and the REST API. So on the right-hand side is some sort of the internal structure. The heartbeat generator is very simple. Again, just generates heartbeats, sends it out of socket. Don't really need to say much more about that, I think. REST API is all the user interaction. And then the message switch handles the message flow. And there's some reasons for that particular design choice I'll get into in a moment. Um, this let the client be really simple. It just monitors heartbeats, generates heartbeats back to the server, and listens to commands and sends things back. Ended up being about 1,000 lines of Ruby. Most of that is things like options parsing, dealing with configuration, stuff like that. The actual code to run the execution is tiny. Um, it was kind of cool. Um, the server, as I talked about before, has this REST endpoint for control. We used Web Machine. Um, generally, Web Machine worked very well for us um, for this. The one thing is we went, when we started adding server set events with Web Machine, um, we discovered that if you want a permanently open server set event machine socket, it's a little tricky to do in Web Machine because it kind of expects there to be an endpoint, the, the, the rights to stop. And so we had an event feed, which is all the jobs on the system. And that created a little bit of weirdness with Web Machine. We were able to make it work, but um, it took a little finagling. Um, the other, other part of this is this client configuration endpoint. It's how we set up the crypto for the rest of the system. It's how we configure things like heartbeat rate and what address to actually connect to the server. Because the HTTP endpoint may be going through proxies and other network things. And so you need to give back some information on how actually to connect to the server. Um, so that may be a different address than the API endpoint. Um, there's also some things around how we do the topology of our systems that make it a little more complicated to find the server. So being able to do that. Um, so one of the core design decisions we made is we have this central message switch. So we have zero MQ uh, dealer, router dealer connection pattern. So the uh, dealer side of the socket yeah, the dealer side of the socket, I always get these backwards, um, is gets all, we advertise, you know, port 10,000 connect here to the clients. That's the dealer socket. Um, Zero MQ really wants that socket to be owned by a single process or thread. It, it is very picky about multi-threaded access to sockets. Um, generally, you don't want to go there. Um, so we ended up with a message switch process in Erlang that basically handles routing client messages to the monitoring processes, starts new monitoring processes, and uh, transmits outgoing messages to the uh, clients. Um, so we use GProc extremely heavily here. GProc is the glue for our system. Um, we have a process for every single job and execution in the system. We have a process for every client that's connected to the system. We have processes, we probably went a little process crazy, but we have processes for just about any autonomous object you have. GProc is how we find them. Um, and so the message switch uses GProc for just about every message coming in. Um, some pro messages come in with a name, so we use the name of the client to find the client process. GProc handles that. We use, um, there's a zero MQ routing tag that gets prefixed to a message coming in um, when the, some of those messages don't have a client name on them, but the routing tag lets us identify what, what client it came from, so we want to reply, we know what address to use, and we have the client manager process indexed by that in GProc. And um, I'll say that GProc was an absolute champion for us. That worked super well as an architecture. So the client monitoring, which I mentioned a moment before, we have one process per connected client. Um, it's basically the state machine that tracks the state of the client. So the client monitor and the client are essentially a pair of state machines that are in sync. If they get out of sync, the client monitor resets the client. 
Um, so a bunch of stuff gets centralized into the client monitor. Incoming message decoding and signing is uh, signature check is there. Um, outgoing message signing happens there. We track heartbeats from the client and you decide when the client has died on us. If we don't get heartbeats after a while, we shut, decide the client has gone away and shut down things. Um, and it tracks the general state of the client. As I say, if it deviates from where it should be, we reset. Um, we really f took as simple as we could possibly conceive of as error handling here. And um, that was pretty effective. I'll mention that we later moved, uh, when we moved to 0MQ4, um, encryption and message signing went into 0MQ. And so some of those functions went out. So just to sort of reiterate where we are here, so we have a command switch, which is essentially a message forwarding system. And then we have these uh, client monitor processes, which do pretty much everything else with the messages, both on the send and receive side. The other processes we have is for job execution. We have a FSM per, per pro process per job. And again, um, we handle the global flow of execution. And then if a client execution gets out of where it should be when executing a job, if the two state machines don't look like they're synced, this is the thing that says, you, you're, you're wrong, go away, die. It's a kind of a brutal error handling scheme. And you can certainly imagine being more sophisticated. Um, in practice, this has worked surprisingly well. Um, I, I kept on being surprised with how often really stupid, simple solutions <laughs> work for us here. Um, so that's architectural recap coverage is really to give some motivation to, uh, what we, to talk about what we did with scaling. And I advertise this as a scalable system for remote command execution. Um, it's somewhat correct. Um, we got around 8K connected nodes, a bit higher um, in, um, with some tuning. So there's a couple different axes of scaling. Number of active clients. Did you have a sure. Two questions. Uh, if you have this much software or client already, uh, what is the reason to move tracking on the server as opposed to client monitoring itself at this time? Um, I guess, so the, the question was, is if you have all this software on the client, why do all this monitoring on the server rather than the client decide? Just have client die, then it's wrong. That's it. Um, there are some reconnection scenarios where the client and the server can get out of sync. And we took the simple model of the server is always right. Um, and that if the client, say, is midway through job execution um, or is waiting for quorum vote to command, and the server dies and goes away and somehow loses where it was, we decided to come back and have the server say, nope, this is, yeah, you might have been right, but the new state is this, rather than try to handle some of these stranded client use cases and other, get fancy with it. Um, so that's most of the monitoring. And the clients do monitor heartbeats from the server and reset themselves. But they don't have a global view of the job execution state in the same way. So it just kind of flowed into the server. Um, and as I say, the client, we tried to, if we could take something out of the client, we probably would. We really tried very hard to keep it simple. Does that answer? Yep. And yes, feel free to ask questions. I, um, happy to answer them. So there's a couple of scaling axes that we were interested in. Number of active clients, um, the heartbeat rate, um, the number of and the number of clients that you can run in a single job. And those are somewhat tied together. Um, the uh, number of active clients and the heartbeat rate really are a trade space because the resource limiting, the sort of the late rate limiting resource is throughput through the command switch. And so you can either send, you know, have a thousand heartbeat clients heartbeating once a second, or you can have 10,000 clients heartbeating every 10 seconds. And the trade space is pretty linear in that zone. Um, and I'm going to give some numbers, but I, I really want to give a sort of a don't trust my numbers past one sig fig, because all the measurement was done in EC2. And um, 
it's like, you know, you have to check the weather in EC2 sometimes before you run a performance test because on a bad day, I think the whole software package had failed and then I'd start it up on a fresh set of nodes and discover, no, it's running now. Um, uh, I guess we, you know, this is a pretty communications intensive and getting a bad switch layout or a noisy neighbor seems to be a thing. So, as I say, my numbers, trust them to one sig fig, but don't, don't, uh, don't quote me on anything finer than that. Um, so as I say, the full about 8 to 10K connected clients, it's a pretty linear trade-off. Um, heartbeat rate versus con um, connected clients. We ended up, for a lot of our testing, just shooting for heartbeats per second as the metric. Um, that, 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 gets, makes, that can simplify a lot of our testing thing. Um, one thing we discover is because the heartbeat system, expiry system is a linear walk, basically um, we uh, ha started having trouble around 8K clients no matter what the heartbeat rate was. Just simply we hit that linear walk and we generate a stampede as we discovered things were expiring. Um, also, you run a large job. Jobs are net. Most of the time, we go to a lot of effort to uh, dither and um, fuzz our packet arrival times between clients so they don't get a natural stampede. And then we create this natural synchronization method which, method, which is called a job. So we start a job, and yes, everybody reports, and everybody starts the job, and everybody answers back. And um, so there's a bit of a stampede factor that happens around that. So what we're hitting is around 1K clients in a single job. We started hitting some things. And there's some obvious steps to take to that that we haven't gotten to. Um, and we'll get to where we are in a little bit. Um, the other part is scalability testing. So we use this Ruby client, which is great, except that every client needs its own Ruby processes. And Ruby processes can get kind of big. Um, doesn't eat much CPU, eats a lot of RAM. Um, a client on a Docker VM, it's about 50 megs. So you can end up buying some relatively expensive servers to run your test machines on. Um, don't make the mistake of setting up 10K nodes and going on vacation, or your boss will have a nice chat with you about your EC2 bill. Um, so our basic unit of testing ended up being about 500 nodes in this. And that was valuable. Um, you can't really replace testing the real client running real jobs in the end. But for a lot of our testing, we ended up building a simulator. Um, basically, that was, that was one of the smartest moves we made. And if, if I was going to do this whole project again, I would probably write the simulator before I wrote the client. Um, it's much more efficient. We get about 50K per simulated client. Um, it goes CPU bound long before it goes memory bound, and it lets you do some reasonable scale simulations on the laptop. Um, the other downside is to do this, we ended up replicating most of the client's behavior in Erlang. Remember how we said we were doing that client in Ruby because it would be uh, uh, easier? Uh, we ended up duplicating a lot of the work um, once we built the simulator. Still wouldn't, wouldn't wouldn't reg don't regret it a moment. Um, it makes the testing process a lot simpler. But it does beg the question of kind of, well, why did we write a Ruby client since we already kind of have an Erlang client built into the simulator? Um, and when I call a simulator, it's a pretty high resolution simulator, obviously. We run the exact state machine of the client, simulate actually executing a job. Basically, the only thing we don't do is actually execute commands on the server. Um, and the idea is to try to get as realistic as possible behavior through our state machines and really be able to stress the server exactly like the real world does. Um, so talk about some of the issues. So I wrote this so I can take the blame. So the client monitors. Basically, the client monitors are sort of self-clocked. They get a packet, get a, a heartbeat packet. They look at the timestamp decide if the packets are arriving at a good rate, continue. Except that when you don't get packets, you don't get messages, and that process never wakes up. So you need a watchdog timer. So um, I rather naively just put a watchdog timer in the process with Erlang start timer. 
that did not scale. Um, somewhere around 500 or 1,000 client monitors uh, started getting really bad behavior out of the beam. And this is about Erlang R15 or early R16, just to um, give you a, a sort of a stamp, time stamp on that. Um, we replaced that with that periodic sweep I mentioned earlier. Um, basically, uh, again, simplest possible implementation. We made a linear sweep through all the clients, and if they hadn't had a heartbeat in a while, we cleaned them up. And in a lot of ways, lazy is pretty okay for this, because an inactive client isn't using much resource. All you really lose by sort of deferring that sweep is a little bit of precision in detecting when a node went down. Um, it's, that's more of a, what I would call quality of service, or uh, it's less of a performance issue and just more what kind of standard do you really want to provide to your users on that. So I keep on talking about this message switch. Message switch, we found it kind of got, what should I say? Zero MQ's sort of natural idioms kind of led us into choosing this message switch. Um, the message switch probably has caused us more trouble than any other part of the system in terms of scaling. Um, so to, to, to sort of go over this, all messages, both incoming and outgoing, go through this message switch. It's kind of the shape of a dealer router socket, is, is you get a message with a tag on it from the client, you can reply to it with the same tag, but it all has to go through the same socket to end up winding going back to the client. Um, it also had the job of, when we get a first connection from a new client, it started up the monitor process, did the initial packet validation, made sure that someone wasn't trying to do a denial of service attack on us or anything like that. So it had a bit of other things. It wasn't just a message switch. Um, so again, this was forced into us because Zero MQ's shape wants one thread to have control or one process and because of sort of the dealer router. We did improve it a little bit by adding a broker, splitting the process creation work from the, uh, um, the uh, message forwarding work. Um, it brought us another 2x, 3, 4k heartbeats a second. Um, the big win was stability. Because we'd have forward, 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 and then we'd go off and we'd create a process and do some other work, and we'd stop forwarding messages. So we had these bubbles in our message flow. Um, splitting those two was kind of an obvious step, and we probably should have done it sooner. But then we, uh, we had a 3, 4K. We're trying to figure out what to do. One thing was trying to get um, multiple message switches. Um, we started hitting some bottlenecks. And this is where some of the stuff got interesting with the NIF. Um, we used active zero MQ sockets. Every active socket goes through the same, an Earl ZMQ NIF to NIF. Every active socket, every active message goes, every active socket's messages go through a single thread. Um, whether it's not just every, every single socket in the system. So if you're forwarding, if you have your uh, message switch uh, and you're for being, having processes forwarded from the broker, you send <laughs> stuff through that switch through that process twice, that thread twice, um, ended up being a bit of a problem. Moving to passive sockets um, fixed it um, at the cost of a somewhat uglier and CPU burning uh, proxy because now we're ping ponging behind to check if they're Erlang messages, check if they're zero MQ messages. Um, so this passive socket thing, we've Took this, tuned this a bit. Um, a lot of this work was done by Stephen Grady of Erlang Solutions, by the way. Um, proof throughput somewhat, hit some bottlenecks around logger because we were trying to log every state transition. And once you start throwing 10, 10K messages a second at logger, we started hitting uh, process queues backing up with logger. So we, we need to find a better logging solution. Turning off logger got us past that. Some things that looked like zero MQ th throughput problems, but we're running at about six, eight K messages a second. <sighs> then we hit the sort of gobstopper. Um, the party ends when zero MQ throws an assert. And there are about 
two or three points of assertion that we kept on consistently hitting with zero MQ. So a bit of step testing. Earl ZMQ NIF library with Earl ZMQ2 worked out to be pretty stable. Something happens when you move to Earl ZMQ4. It seems to be a bit thrust, fussier about threading. I know there's something around closing sockets that's uh, a, bit, a bit stricter. Um, but we kept on seeing it throw asserts, and you know, with a NIF, you're part, you know, your day's over. Um, we added locks around some of the stuff. I'm not actually clear whether we are, the, the actual rules of using the zero MQ library are not exactly well defined. So adding locks helped, but I'm not actually sure if I fixed the problem by adding locks or I just delayed things enough so it randomly worked. And um, it was a frustrating experience. Um, and I found myself asking, before we head down this rabbit hole, is there a better approach? As most of you probably know, the community's kind of been moving away from Earl ZMQ. Last year, there was the uh, um, CZMQ presentation of one approach. Um, there is EZMQ, which is an Erlang native thing. And um, I don't know if the author's in the audience or not, but it just, not to um, denigrate what they've done, but it doesn't seem like Earl ZMQ2 is the active focus of much development anymore. Um, so I had kind of stepped back a little bit when I hit this, um, because there's a bunch of rat holes you can dive into with NIFs and um, didn't really want to do it. I kind of was tempted to rewrite the whole thing using the dirty scheduler NIF stuff, and it would have been cool, and it would have been simplifying the code, and it would have been fun to actually use some of those features, but, uh, and if I ended up going back and doing it, it would be kind of cool, but yeah, sometimes you just have to step back and ask why you're doing things. So I'm going to talk through just the lessons learned here. And I'm running, I guess I'm OK on time. Um, we hit very few real Erlang bottlenecks. Um, Erlang, by and large, was not our biggest problem. Gproc at 10K processes and more worked really, really well. Um, the model using one process, process per client um, was really, in general, pretty workable. Um, and boy, did the let it crash approach simplify our code. Um, just about every time we remove, moved an error handling case, our stability just went, got better. Um, you never <laughs> really are able, well, that's general edge. It's really hard to test your error handling well. And I've had more bugs in my error handling code than just about anything else I've ever written. Um, all right, I'm going to switch tracks here for something. Just an ode to system tap. System tap has become one of my favorite tools during this process. When you have a NIF that is acting up and you have a lot of threads in flight and a lot of other things going on, being able to track things with system tap has been, has been a godsend. Um, so I used it to figure out that, hey, I'm hammering this one thread that I don't get to see it from the Erlang side. But this NIF thread that everything goes through became pretty obvious immediately with a little bit of system tap monitoring that there's one thread, and that's what that thread is doing. This is actually from an Earl ZMQ test where I was managing to replicate one of the, uh, er or the uh, mutex errors I was getting. I had made some changes and hadn't quite gotten the things right. And I just wanted to highlight what, what you can see with this. The top highlighted region is a user inserted trace in the uh, test code, Erlang test code. The middle one is monitoring out of the beam. Of the, in that case, this is the uh, um, return from the NIF call, Earl ZM, uh, the Earl ZMQ closed call. And the final one is a C entry to the mutex destroy function. And in this case, I noticed that the uh, mutex destroy never exited. And that was a really vital piece of information that made it a lot easier to find out what the heck was happening with this failure. Um, and um, the ability to get visibility across Erlang code, Beam interpreter, and raw C is really wonderful. It's not, it's, you can't get there with GDB, at least if you, if you can, I'd love to know how. Um, so here endeth the uh, uh, ode to, zero, um, to uh, system tap. I think I'm going to try to get us to be shipping 
our uh, future systems with system tap built as part of the uh, executable because I also used this as a uh, debugging tool for a customer pro problem in the field recently. Um, oops. One thing we hit, tracking 10K processes in any meaningful fashion is hard. Getting a good visibility on what's happening when every one of your process clients decide to drop dead and you don't really know what happened and there's no ordering, never really got a good sense on how to do that. And if people have suggestions, I'd love, to, love for you to grab me and tell me what you know. Um, logging, we saturate the logger message system. We have this problem with a number of our other, our other Erlang-based projects where we sometimes find ourselves having to turn off logging just when things get really hairy, which is, um, we may be doing it wrong. Uh, I don't know. Um, transient, transient node state, exactly where you are in a job, a lot of these very fine-grained things. We originally tried to log this to Postgres um, again the, the rate at which those changes happened was very difficult to do effectively. I hinted about this earlier. The one thing I regret, we should have written the Erlang client. The client, we list, sort of took the counsel of our fears and wrote it in Ruby. Um, their simulator ended up having about 75% code, code overlap with, the, with what the client would have had. Um, we, do some really strange things where we're running multiple reactors in the same uh, Ruby process to be able to simulate concurrency testing when we're doing uh, um, uh, function tests for the system. If we'd written that in Erlang, we could have commanded the processes through steps much easier. Um, the re one of the original reasons we did this is that we didn't want to have to require people to have Erlang on the system. Um, we kind of rendered that moot because at the time we made the decision originally, we were shipping Chef as a Ruby gem mostly, and we switched to sending things as an omnibus package where we sent, build it with Ruby and everything in the kitchen sink. So um, when you're shipping a 70 megabyte installer package to people, shipping the Erlang VM was is a, <laughs> not the, not that bad. And um, on the bright side, the client ended up so simple that uh, it can be rewritten easily. And one thing ZeroMQ really helped with is that that kept that client very simple. Um, again, ZeroMQ Zero is, is really great to get something, something going and written it. Um, the client is small enough that um, I joke about taking a weekend and writing it in C. And I think it's pretty feasible to do. Um, but if first choice, if we're doing it again, would have written in Erlang. Um, I guess the message I'm giving to people is, uh, you know, don't write off writing Erlang for user side tools and things like that. Uh, we, we kind of had a mental barrier to doing that. All right, here's the, here's the fun. Um, Zero MQ is easy to get started in. Its abstractions and Erlang are a bit of a pain to reconcile. It, it goes to this great effort to abstract away things that are hard to do. Um, the router dealer pattern combines thousands of TCP connections into sort of one logical socket and hides all the details of the connection and disconnection, which is great when you're starting out and you're, especially if you're writing, writing in something like Ruby, this can be annoying. You pay for the simplicity. If your language has trouble with concurrency, this is great. Um, that's not one of the complaints I've heard about Erlang. Um, so, uh, in many ways, you read the ZeroMQ discussions, they love Erlang. They've loved Erlang so much that they've essentially implemented Erlang on their own. And so we kind of ended up with Erlang in front of Erlang. Um, so thinking about this, if, you, you know, if you're familiar with the Gen TCP non-blocking um, server pattern, you can end up with a one-to-one -one binding between the client socket and the client monitor. You don't need a command switch. The command switch, which is the source of so much of our pain, is really just an artifact of the library's abstractions. And yeah, you can open up more than one zero MQ socket, but that socket consumes a port. And ports can be a pain to add. You know, your system ends asking, why do I open, have to open 40 ports in my firewall? And you don't have a very friendly answer to them. Um, the other thing is that 
disconnect, reconnect information that ZeroMQ hides from you so carefully, we actually kind of want to know that. That's part of presence. That tells us something about presence. If the di socket disconnects, then we may actually want to start paying a little more attention to whether heartbeats are there. Um, ZeroMQ kind of hid that from us. I'm not saying that ZeroMQ, I mean, to be clear, the performance of ZeroMQ was not our barrier here with the stability of the library as a barrier, but the sort of, there's an impedance mismatch that we kind of became increasingly aware of. So what are we thinking about doing with this? Um, talked a little bit, looked a little bit at the Erlang Z CZMQ. Um, it has a lot of upsides. And uh, after experiencing with uh, seeing asserts out of ZeroMQ drop the Erlang server dead, uh, I kind of really appreciate the focus on stability. The problem is um, when we added encryption using the ZeroMQ li uh, uh, Zero libraries, the C libraries to be clear, we moved the encryption state into ZeroMQ. So when the thing crashes, we lo lose all the negotiated session information. That vanishes with it. So yeah, Erlang CZMQ would protect us from the crashes, except that we would have to renegotiate every single encrypted connection for the clients. And that really isn't that much worse, that much better, I'm sorry, than the, the server crashing in some extent. Um, and yes, performance is a concern. We really felt like we were beginning to push the NIF hard and going backwards to something that wasn't as focused on performance was a concern. Also mentioned is a minor thing. Um, licensing often becomes an issue with these things. Uh, the dreaded three-letter GPL word appears in the license, and that becomes something you have to explain to the lawyers. Um, wouldn't be the deciding factor. We've kind of grandfathered in zero and Q, but that was just something that flagged it. So the other thing we're looking at is EZMQ, and I've just started playing with this recently. Um, right now, it's really at Earl's, the 2.0 protocol, and we'd have to put some work into getting it for. The Mozilla license is a bonus, though, for us. And it's kind of, I don't know, um, I have an emotional attachment to it. I'm not sure if that's the right choice for us or not, because we probably have to add most all of the encryption functionality of ZeroMQ4 to it. Um, but not having any C libraries to crash after my past month of banging my head against NIF, uh, <laughs> I, I can't exaggerate the appeal of that. So the other option is, all right, it's a zero MQ option. Why not just not use it? Um, as I say, the dealer pattern doesn't really model, map to Erlang that well. We don't get much. PubSub pattern has all sorts of functionality to let you enable multicast and do a lot of cool things. We don't use it. Um, message structure, we're using JSON for our message structure. A lot of the uh, framing features don't actually add much value. Um, big thing missed is the crypto protocol and the client side implementation might be a little less fun. I'm gonna mention that uh, SaltStack, which is a, has some very 